This week on Book Notes, our guest is New York Times columnist Maureen Dowd. She joins us to discuss her book, Bush World, Enter at Your Own Risk. Maureen Dowd, author of columns in the book called Bush World. Where did that title come from? Uh, I had used the term in some columns, and um, I don't know, it just seemed like a natural fit. On the cover is a cartoon by Pat Oliphant. Why? Pat Oliphant and I worked at the Washington Star together when I first started out. And I was a lowly clerk, so he didn't take much notice of me. He was a fantastic star. And um, Arthur Gelb, uh, my mentor at the time, said that Oliphant is the Hirschfeld of political cartoons. And if I could get him to do the cover. So I called him, and he's... Um, a very sort of uh, a little bit on the surface curmudgeonly but really shy Australian and I called him at the very last minute he could only do it in a weekend and Putnam didn't think it could be done in time and I and I said to Putnam but he's used to doing things in a couple of hours and so I called and begged him and he did it and it's I think fantastic in a literal sense and a figurative one what's it say I love the gargoyles you can see there's one on the spine on top of the White House gate What's it say, the, the, the caricature of uh, George Bush itself, you think? Well, I think that, um, you know, sometimes people talk about Cheney and Bush's uh, advisors as, as having led him down the primrose path, but I think Oliphant thinks that the president is responsible for what happens in the White House and that everything is about the president in terms of the coming election. So he wanted to just focus on the president. I had originally thought of having, you know, the whole court of uh, Bush world. What's the term Bush world mean to you? Well, I think, and I think Oliphant uh, captured this in the cover, it's, it's kind of a, a bizarre world where uh, no apologies are made, no twinge of shame is ever expressed, uh, kind of an alternate reality where um, uh, 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 almost like a Jurassic Park where we've been taken on this scary ride and we sort of don't know why and we can't get off. Um, it's a world where uh, they have made their own reality. Uh, WMDs, they still expect to find WMDs. They still think, you know, Iraq had a connection with Al-Qaeda. They still think Iraq had more of a connection than Iran, even though the 9-11 committees have, you know, said otherwise. And, um, they still think they've made the world a safer place, even though the State Department reports more terror incidents now. So, it's our world. Ever okay. met George W. Bush? Oh, yeah. I well, I met him. Well, I guess I didn't meet him. I saw him around during... I was the Times White House reporter in his father's first term. I mean, his father's only term. So I um, saw him around there, and I met him after he became governor when he was governor's elect when he was governor elect i went to the republican governor's conference and he came up to say that he i had written a, a sunday book review of his mom's one of his mom's memoirs that gave it a favorable review and he came up to say that he liked it and was very charming bantering and at that point i thought wow this is a completely different guy than what he seemed to be when he was the loyalty enforcer in his dad's white house firing Sununu and kind of checking everyone's loyalty. What's, uh, what's the name Cobra mean to you? Oh, that's the nickname he gave me. He gives everyone nicknames, and that's mine. What's it supposed to mean? Well, I guess you'd have to ask him. And, and you first met, uh, in the mix of all this, George Herbert Walker Bush when? Oh, I covered his... Well, let me think. Um, I'm not sure exactly when we met, uh, I first started doing political reporting during the 1984 race, and I covered Ferraro. So I covered the debate where George Herbert Walker Bush said, you know, was pleased with his performance and said he had kicked a little whatever. So I, I've had experience with the Bushes kind of overdoing it on the macho stuff for a long time. That was my first experience with him. What was your experience like when you went to the presidential library? Oh, well, that was... Um, right after his son got elected and um, uh, the former President Bush asked me to be a speaker at a panel on White House and the media and um, 
I win, and he's, he was charming, as he always has been to me. I mean, he's really a lovely guy and always was to me. And, um, but he joked that he had to wait until Barbara left the country to invite me to the library, except then I don't think it was a joke, <laughs> because she was out of the country. But um, he, um, he was very proud of his son that night and was just sort of glowing to be the first, you know, uh, uh, president and, and who had a son as president since the Adams, Adamses. And he, um, he was fine, but his advisors were very, very worried about um, the tone of the second Bush White House. And they thought there had already been tussles with Russia and China. And they thought uh, it was way too belligerent. And I remember one of them saying to me, we thought the Clinton guys made it up as they went along. But um, these guys are really, you know, being too sort of barrel-chested and too improvisational and too belligerent. And so the tone among his aides was very, you know, what's happening here? We were internationalists and they're acting like unilateralists. You dedicate your book for my mom who thinks all the bushes are swell. Right. Um, Where's mom live? Mom is in Chevy Chase. Here in the Washington area. Right. And um, she uh, she has been, I mean, she stayed up all night the night Truman won with my dad and was a very excited Democrat and uh, then became a Reagan Democrat and then a Reagan Republican and loved Ronald Reagan. And I took her to a White House Christmas party once in the first Bush White House. And um, Bush kissed her. And in the car on the way home, she was quiet for a while, and then she turned to me and she said, I never want you to write a mean word about that man again. <laughs> And I said, Mom, I'm a reporter. But um, she loved Clinton, too. I mean, she identified with Clinton because she thought he was very kind of, he could be insecure and vulnerable, and she identified with that. She's kind of a Catholic, literally, and in her political taste. In your introduction, you, uh, or acknowledgement, you say Peggy Dowd dwells happily in Bush world, but she is the most loyal sister on the planet, so she is always there for me, even when I tweak a present, she passionately admires ditto my niece, Jen. Mm. Where is Peggy Dowd? Well, um, my sister is fantastic, but she, she um, actually worked on W's uh, convention, in the, in the last convention, and I, uh, she, there was no hotel room in town, so she shared my hotel room, so I was always getting home from writing my column, kind of tweaking the Republicans, and there would be a W stands for women placard, you know, in the living room. Um, she's wonderful. She, um, she is threatening to cut me out of her will and use my brother, who's an attorney, to do it, because they're all very conservative Republicans. So uh, they all give me a hard time, but they love me. And why do they give you a hard time? <laughs> because they're very conservative Republicans, and they love this president. And it's sort of like, you know, when I, during the Clinton years, they loved when I tweet Clinton during impeachment or whatever, but they forget about that during the Republican years and just think I'm, uh, they forget that I'm an equal opportunity skeptic. Skeptic. Mm. What's that mean? Well, uh, it means someone who isn't a cynic, but who also isn't going along with the spin, I would say. I think, you know, what I do is, um, my theory is that um, presidents and politicians have a lot of people on the public payroll to put out their version of events. And oftentimes, for whatever reason, their version of events, it tends to be misleading. So I think journalism at its best can kind of uh, do pentimento and go underneath the portrait they're giving and try and give uh, Americans uh, what is really happening, what is underneath what they're saying that is the true portrait at our best, I would say. For someone who's never read you, when did your column start? It started in 1995, on July 4th. And when did you first know that you might even have an opportunity to write a column? 
Um, well, I had heard it talked about, but I really, uh, I wasn't sure I wanted to do it, and I didn't really think I'd be good at it, because I'm, um, you know, I'm not uh, a natural, I wouldn't say, like Tom Friedman or Anna Quinlan. I mean, they are Abe Rosenthal. They're all very sure of what they think, and they're very, you know, articulate about what they think. And uh, I... You know, it takes me a while to figure out what I think, and also I don't, I'm not a natural polemicist the way Sapphire is, for instance. I mean, that form of 700 words is perfect for him because he has an opinion and then he just gets it across. And my form of journalism was mostly letting people reveal themselves through their own quotes and and me making observations and metaphors and all those things take a lot of space. So in a column, if you put in two or three quotes, it's over. And when I first started, I remember Tom and Anna saying, you can't, you know, have too many quotes, it's hard. You know, and they had both been journalists, too. And so for me, it was an exact reversal of the kind of journalism I loved and that I had done. And, uh, you know, I still miss that kind of journalism. I mean, it's hard for me just to be stating an opinion very strongly, you know, rather than an indirect kind of letting people talk and seeing where we go. Do people that read newspapers understand the role of a columnist? I don't know, because, you know, in a way, it's kind of um, uh, because of the Babel, the Tower of Babel on cable and, um, and blogs. You know, there's so much opinion. Now I, I have to nexus. If I think of a funny line, uh, like if I think of a line like, uh, are they crying Wolfowitz, for instance, I have to nexus it because in the hours before my column would get in, you know, Mickey Kaus could have used it or, or someone else on a blog, or it might be um, on cable, one of the, you know, commentators, and then you'd be using something old. Um, like the other day at the convention, you know, when I saw John Kerry in the space suit, I thought he looked very much like Woody Allen playing a sperm and everything you want to know about sex. But before I could write that in a column, John Tierney used it in his column, and, um, Somebody else, oh, oh, Tucker Carlson used it on Crossfire. So, so there's so much opinion everywhere in the ether that, you know, it's not like the old days when Walter Lippmann or James Reston would expound and everyone was waiting for that and that was the last word. How many columnists are there, regular columnists in the New York Times? Um, well, that's a good question because now we're, we're getting in guest columnists. So like I'd, Barbara Ehrenreich. Yeah, and we have... Um, uh, another legal affairs columnist from Slade who's starting, I think, very soon. And um, I don't know, I'd have to count them up because it's, we're losing and get and gaining. But traditionally, all the time. six or seven? Yeah, more eight. And, and, and how, for a journalist, how big a deal is it to have one of those spots? Oh, well, it's a huge deal. I mean, um, they call it, you know, the best real estate in the business. And, um, you know, sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night and I just cannot believe that I am a columnist on the Times Up Ed page and and you know I get very insecure and think well who wants to hear what I have to say and that's why I try to rely on reporting more you know because it is it's terrifying like to be expounding from those Olympian heights I mean I don't think Tom and Sapphire have those sort of qualms you know I think you know What's the worst thing that's happened to you in the sense of feedback that you get over these years? Oh, you know, people, um, as the discourse in the country has coarsened and uh, broadened out with the Internet, you know, people do feel free to say really, really nasty and personal stuff. And I think I don't write about people's personal lives unless they... Uh, become a federal case, as with Monica. Like, I would never have written about Monica if she were not part of the um, impeachment investigation. But I think because I tend to focus on the personalities of leaders, then sometimes people think it's okay to, you know, talk about my personal life, which is not what I'm doing with them. I only talk about their personal lives as they affect them as leaders or policy. So lots of times people will say really, really nasty stuff and emails are on the air about me and um, you know it's hard that's the hard part of the job I would say that's uh, even harder than being a polemicist 
How many times a week? It's twice a week. What days? Uh, my days are Thursday and Sunday. And how many newspapers run it? Um, you know, I've never asked. I was afraid <laughs> that the answer might not be good. I don't know. Uh, in, in your columns, periodically, you will give us a, a little bit of your own personal background. One of them, for instance, I remember you got a couple of brothers that were pages in the Senate back in the 50s. Right. How big is the Dowd family? Uh, well, I have three brothers and one sister and zillions of nieces and nephews, and they're all in Washington. And my brothers were um, pages for Prescott Bush, actually, this president's grandfather, and they said he was a senator straight out of central casting, very tall and craggy, and always wore gray worsted wool suits, even in summer. And um, they were also pages for JFK and Nixon. And funnily enough, and they and my brother delivered the mail to them, and their offices were next to each other at one point. And my brother said that JFK was always sort of icy, you know, saving his magnetism for the crowds, and that Nixon was always so friendly and sweet to the pages, and would, you know, be nice to them and save them if Lyndon Johnson was, you know, after them for something. And um, so they tell stories, and I think maybe because my family, and my father was a police detective who was in charge of Senate security for 20 years and was in charge of security during the Army McCarthy hearings. And I think that maybe that gives me a perspective uh, on Washington, for instance, during the Clinton impeachment. I mean, because of stories my brother had told about answering the phone from senators' wives, and they'd be calling, saying, I'm going to come down there if you don't get the senator to the phone. And then Bobby Baker, the sergeant of arms, would be rushing around looking for the husband who was off with another woman. I mean, I always had thought, you know, politicians have always, you know, uh, had um, these kind of um, dalliances. So it, it did not seem to me an impeachable offense, you know, because in my family I'd heard about this from my brothers. You know, it just seemed part of politics. How old are your brothers today? Oh, well, they are in their late 60s. And what do they do? Uh, one of my brothers is a lawyer, and one's an artist, and one's a salesman. And how about your sister? My sister has the most fantastic uh, job title in Washington. She is the executive assistant to the executive director of the Trade Association for Trade Associations. Younger or older? They're all older. Where were you born? I was born in Washington. My first memory actually is of the Capitol. My mom driving down to pick up my dad at night. And I, I thought the statue on top was an Indian and it was only Years later, when I did a story about it, when they took it down to clean it, I did a story for the Washington um, Bureau and found out that it was actually a woman, you know, and not an Indian, so. Where'd you go to high school? Uh, I went to Immaculata. I went to Catholic schools all the way through. And then where'd you go to college? Catholic, yeah. What'd you study? English, literature, what special, specializing in uh, Shakespeare. And, and when was your, what was your first job out of college? I uh, worked at the Washington Hilton in the racket club, hiring and firing lifeguards and tennis instructors. What was your first writing job? Well, my family had an intervention after a certain point and told me I had to get a job where I wasn't wearing a tennis dress to the office. And um, my brother called me up one night and said, come down to this bar. You know, there's a friend of mine here. And it was Dave Bergen, who was the Metro editor of the Washington Star. And he agreed to hire me, and I said, well, can I wait until the tennis season is over? And then he said, you're fired. But then the next day we worked it out, and I started, I kept my job at the tennis club, but I started working as a clerk at the Star on the 9 p.m. shift, 9 to 5 a.m. What did you do after the Washington Star folded? Um, I uh, went to Time Magazine for a couple of years and worked in the Washington Bureau in New York, and as a writer and as a reporter. And then Anna Quinlan hired me onto the Metro desk of the New York Times. She found my uh, clips moldering in some drawer somewhere and called me. And, and up to this point, where had you learned how to write? Um, I'd always loved writing, but I never really thought of making a profession of it until I was at the Star. Uh, my ambition is always kind of lateral. I mean, I'd see uh, other people doing it, and I'd think, well, I could do that. So at the Star, the clerks would 
we were actually dictationists. So when reporters would call in, it was an afternoon paper, we would put on our headsets and type up their stories, and then it would go straight into the afternoon paper. So, you know, once I began seeing what their stories were like and what the other dictationists were doing, I began to think, well, I could do that, maybe. This, so we, then we would work at night on our own stories. This network is 25 years old this year. Right. And I we have that. never, ever had you. I only mention it because <laughs> we've never seen you on this network except in performance somewhere with one of these events out there in the world. But I am always watching at home, Brian. Thank you. No, but what I really want to know is you clearly don't like this medium, or at least you. I don't did it. Out. Actually, I used to do it when I first started, and then. Uh, I had this disastrous experience on Nightline. Alexander Stanley and I went on, and we went on to do a show about Bush Sr.'s first year in office, the style of it. And um, Ted Koppel was just in a bad mood that night. He, he wrote me a letter of apology afterwards, which is more valuable to me than all the letters I've gotten from presidents, because it's so rare. But uh, suffice it to say that the show didn't go that well. And um, it ended up in a book as the worst show in Nightline history, which is not where you want to be. But that isn't even why I stopped doing TV. I stopped doing it because right at about that time, uh, television began to be all about um, the right and the left, which it still is in a way. And when they'd call to ask you to do it, they'd say, tell us which side you're going to be on. And if you'd say, I don't want to take a side, you know, they would say, then you can't because we're going to pair you up with so-and-so, so you have to choose. And I just think that that um, put you in a box too much. It's not conducive to creative or imaginative thinking. So I just kind of opted out. Well, when you, uh, by the way, whose idea was it to do this book of columns? Well, you know, it was funny because I, I always thought columns were too ephemeral to put in a book. I mean, I loved reading Anna Quinlan's and Tom's when they were in, in book form. Tom Friedman. Yeah, but for me, I, I was afraid they would just be too ephemeral because my shtick is to be right on top of the news and right in the news. And I thought, uh, like, like with Clinton impeachment, I won a Pulitzer for those columns, but I thought maybe it was like the fever in a Midsummer's Night dream. It would just snap and then people wouldn't want to really hear about it again. But in this case, I think that, um, you know, it has the extra dimension of this incredible father-son drama, which, you know, I mean, I've been fascinated with father-son dramas uh, in myth and literature and Shakespeare and, you know, uh, they used the Joseph Campbell myth to do Star Wars. Luke Skywalker had the light, you know, good father and then Darth Vader was the dark, bad father and, I mean, that aspect of it uh, fascinated me and I also think because of uh, uh, the neocons hijacking the war on terror that, and, and the invasion of Iraq that this will be something that will be studied in politics classes and journalism classes for decades to come and will affect the country for generations to come so this and also because people had been misled by the administration there were so many you know you'd see Fox viewers 80 percent still think there's an Al Qaeda Iraq connection so uh, I thought that at some point a lot of Americans were going to want to, as they say in the CIA, walk the cat back and start at the beginning and see how they got into this. So I thought in this case it might be worth it. Uh, published by Penguin. Uh, my first reaction when I picked up the book was, and I've read you since you started, and anybody that's read you since you started know that you are not timid about the Clinton years and people who liked Bill Clinton didn't like what you wrote. Would that be fair to say? Oh. Well, yes. I mean, they didn't like it at all. I mean, they... Right, I know. Republicans, you know, hate me when a Republican president is in and love me when a Democratic one is in. I mean, right now, they love what you're doing about George Bush. But my reaction was, why would you put out a only the Bush World book, which if I picked it up and didn't know you, I'd say, this person is a left-wing, whatever, hating George Bush and never writes a bad word about the other side. Why would you do that? Well, in retrospect, I, you know... Now that I see it, I've fallen in love with, like, hard covers. It's fascinating and amazing to see your work in hard covers and intimidating. You think, is this, you know, I read it and sometimes I'll read it and think, is this good enough? And other times I'll think, well, that's cool to see it that way. And I wish I had done the Clinton, but I don't think it's too late. I'm thinking now, you know, the sequel will be Hillary Land because I have all the Clinton stuff. And I think the Clintons will be in ascension again, depending on what happens. So it only just happened that this 
uh, father-son drama covering this one family for 25 years in this unique historical situation kind of drew me to the book world. But, um, but I, you know, obviously I'm going to do more that are not about Republicans or the Bushes. Well, looking back at some of the columns that you wrote on either Al Gore or, or Bill Clinton, here's uh, some words that you used to describe Al Gore. Phony, smarmy, sniveling, preppy sneak. Hmm. Remember those? Mm, maybe. <laughs> uh, and there are others. The Animal House president, talking about Bill Clinton, has messed up big time again, and he must be dragged back from the precipice by the bimbo patrol. I mean, anybody's read you used to all that. Um, did you ever get any feedback from the Clintons or the Gores? Well, the Clintons, both Hillary and Bill, were always charming to me when I met them, and still are. Um, you know, I heard what they would say maybe behind my back but you know I don't blame them I mean you know if I were a president and had me writing about them I'd say the same thing well, why I mean what what role then is why well, I think it's hard you know it's hard for anyone to take criticism I can't take cri criticism I can't read anything about myself my family is astonished I ended up in this profession because when I was little I was so overly sensitive I thought sensitivity was like a disease like leukemia you could die of and I think it is hard to hear criticism, but I think that people who succeed in any profession, leaders, have to either surround themselves with people who will tell them the truth, or they have to read people who are telling them the truth, one or the other. They're going to get it on the inside or the outside. And people like this President Bush, who do not read newspapers and let you know, his vice president filter, filter all information to him and uh, you know, and he also, um, he doesn't listen to a large group of people and he has not surrounded himself with people who give him a hard time and say, no, you know, maybe we should look at it from another point of view. I mean, we all hoped Colin Powell would do that, but he didn't really. He had more people like Tennant, who was constantly apple polishing and telling him what he wanted to hear, telling him the intelligence would be a slam dunk when clearly it wasn't, and even Bush realized it wasn't. He said, you know, after that first briefing, you know, that doesn't look like there's much here, but Tennant said, no, no, it's a slam dunk. Almost like apple polishing more than Bush wanted to hear. So I think, you know, I think that uh, journalists serve a great role in society of, of checks and balances and kind of, of opening the veil to tell the truth, but I can, I am, as someone who's hypersensitive myself, I can really understand where you don't want to hear it and don't like the messenger. You refer to Murderer's Row in your book. What is it? Oh, that, um, that's what we call um, Tom Friedman and Bill Sapphire and I are all in the same uh, hall, and also Johnny Apple is an honorary member, although not technically a columnist, but he is. The columnists in the New York Times have their own office. Yeah, and Johnny has his own office, and obviously Johnny has opinions, so um, I included him in murder as well. And you're right here in Washington? Yes. Always write your column. Do you, do you write your column in your office? Uh, yes, I do. And until I got an office there, I think Sapphire was the worst dressed guy in the corridor. But now I think I have that honor. Uh, A.O. Scott, I, I understand from listening to somebody else mentioned him on the radio one time, his name's Tony. Right, I right. They call him Tony right. Scott. Uh, in April of 1999, wrote about you. Did you remember reading that? I never read anything about myself. I just asked my sister to read it and tell me if I'm going to be fired. But here is you're a, not going to read it. Are yeah, you oh, sure I am. Here, here is a fellow though that works at the newspaper where you work, and he's writing this about you. No, he didn't work there then. He was at. Uh, he wrote that for Slate or something. Yeah, I did at the that. end. No, at no the, we hired him after that. Well, at the end of this particular piece of paper I have, it says A.L. Scott is a film critic in the New York no, Times. No, he wasn't okay. then. He had no Here, Here's what he said about then. you. I haven't even met him, actually. But. Okay. Like anyone who tries to be funny, Dad sometimes strains for effect and falls flat. She posed a choice between New York's Rudolph <laughs> Giuliani and Washington's Marion Barry as one between the mayor and the cracks down on crime and the mayor whose crime was crack. At other, like times, you know, <laughs> at other times, her glibness gets in the way of her insight. <laughs> historians will, this is you saying, historians will long ponder how Mrs. Clinton came in as Eleanor Roosevelt and left as Madonna. They will, he says. 
like anyone who must produce 700 words of headline-based observation twice a week. She appears on occasion to phone in her copy as when she imagined a series of U.S. history documentaries directed by Oliver Stone. Abigail Adams is really Lucianne Goldberg. And she could set a welcome example for pundits everywhere if she took a solemn public oath never to write another word about Ally McBeal. St I, I can go on, but I mean, um, what do you think about this, that first line about, sh you know, f your humor falls flat? I think it's definite. I'm sure it's true sometimes. I think humor is very subjective and really hard. And I hope I don't offend anyone when I say I think it's, it's really hard for women, too, in particular. Um, uh, and I think that the, the best humor is a little bit um, tart. You know, when, for instance, Jon Stewart, I think, is fantastic. I mean, it's got to be a little bit tart. And you've got to be willing to offend people. And sometimes, as a woman, I don't want to offend people as easily <laughs> as some guys I know. But um, I think humor is just subjective. I, the only thing that I bring to it, which I think is a good quality, is I'm willing to fall flat on my face and, you know, try something. And then some people will find it funny and some won't, or some will like it and some won't. But I'm willing to try it. And the reason I try, you know, when I started, Michael Kinsley and um, Sapphire said to me, don't use humor so much because you're, uh, it, you'll seem like a girl. You'll seem like a girl columnist, you know if you're doing it everything light you have to be more serious and i always think the reverse i mean in, in ancient kingdoms they had two people that could tell the truth to the, to the king and not get killed the jester and the priest and i can't be a priest still so i think it's a really good way to get a truth and to lure in readers who might otherwise say oh i've read this before you know it's it's kind of a funny way to get people interested in something serious but i always the points i make with humor are always serious the only point I would disagree with him on is that I phone it in because I, I may, people may not like a certain column or may not like columns, but I always give it a hundred percent effort because I always am very conscious of the fact that it's the op-ed page of the New York Times and that's an incredible, you know, and rare honor. How long does it take you to write those 700 words? Well, it depends. I mean, you know, it, the, as we discussed, because of all the opinions floating around on cable and on blogs, the hard thing is getting it's not it's the opposite of reporting where you get your reporting and then you can focus on your writing the hard thing in columns is getting an original idea and it takes a really long time and some you know sometimes i feel like i've really only had one or two a year you know and i'm and it's a uh, psychologically draining more than the actual time russell baker told me one time that he um spent uh i think he said eight hours a week on his column he would spend four on each and I can't do that because I'm always agonizing what is the original idea, what would be a good, you know, an original approach to this. Um, so it takes me longer, just an agony time. Tony, Scott calls you uh, the H.L. Mencken of the Clinton era. Mm, that's nice. But he ends it this way. He says, it's hard to see how her intemperate wit, this is 99, will find adequate targets in either a Gore Jr. or a W. Bush administration. Well, it's funny because when I covered the first Bush administration, I sometimes felt sad that my tr career trajectory and the first Bushes met because as lovely a guy as he was, I felt, you know, I, having specialized in Shakespeare, I wanted, I was hoping for a president who was darker and someone more like Nixon or Johnson and um, complicated. And the first Bush was, you know, a very uncomplicated guy. And that's why... The, the Sun's uh, White House has been such a surprise and revelation because it, it completely gave me the darkness and complication and Shakespearean dimensions that had been missing from the first time I covered the first Bush White House. Let me go down a list of people that you write about all the time and just get you to give us a capsule of what comes to mind when I mention them. Dick Cheney. Well, I would say... <clears throat> Dick Cheney is uh, the villain of Bush world. Um, he is the Darth Vader, the Dark Father, who has brought the Luke Skywalker over to the dark side. Richard Pearl. Richard Pearl, who is also known, calls himself the Prince of Darkness. Um, he's a fantastic, I mean, these guys are all fantastic characters. They're just wonderful characters. And he... Um, 
is definitely one of the architects of, of hijacking the war on terror. He, um, in the book I say that he and Wolfowitz are like the, it was like a Ocean's 9-11 heist uh, of the war on terror for their own purposes, and that he and Wolfowitz are like the um, uh, Brad Pitt and George Clooney of the heist, except they don't quite look as glossy. Who's the boy king? Uh, the Boy King is the president, and um, in the introduction I describe how his, his dad wrote me this hilarious um, uh, parody of my Boy King columns, uh, where he had himself as the old king and Barr as the old queen and the Boy King, and um, he, like me, he finds it easier to express himself in print and can be more freewheeling. Uh, Douglas Fyth. Douglas Fyth is um, uh, the guy uh, in Woodward's book, Colin Powell referred to Doug Fyth and his minions as the Gestapo office. And they're the office in the Pentagon that was in charge of um, uh, the reconstruction. And, and he created a CIA called the Office for Special Plans, his own CIA in the Pentagon when he couldn't get the information he wanted from the real CIA. Scooter Libby. Scooter Libby is a very charming guy. Um, you know him? I know him. I have run into him at White House correspondence dinners, and he has a very sort of James Bond air about him. He can do 10 tequila shooters and show no effect of the alcohol. I mean, he's a very smooth guy. Um, but he is also one of the uh, neocon gang that hijacked the war on terror. And what's he do? He is Dick Cheney's chief of staff. Donald Rumsfeld, and you affectionately call him Rummy? Yes, I think he's very uh, cantanker cantankerously charismatic, I would call him. He's a, a septuagenarian sex symbol. Bill Crystal. Uh, Bill Crystal, well, Bill Crystal I knew really well in the first Bush White House because he was Quayle's chief of staff. They used to call him Quayle's brain. And, um, I think Bill Crystal is very, very smart, and um, I would just say he's one of the like intellectual fathers of the idea that um, we should have this more of a Reagan-esque foreign policy based in moral authority and using force to spread American values in the world. Uh, a man you call Wolfie. Wolfowitz, Paul Wolfowitz, he, Wolfowitz of Arabia. He is Rumsfeld's deputy, and he, um, is also one of the ones who uh, hijacked the war in terror, yeah. Why do you call Carl Rove Iago? Well, sometimes I call Cheney Iago, too. Um, Carl Rove... Um, who he was Iago, by the way? Iago in Shakespeare um, is, Othello's, um, is Othello's top military aide who keeps whispering in his ear saying that Othello's wife has been unfaithful when she hasn't because um, it serves his own purposes and he makes Othello crazy and then Othello ends up killing his wife, so. And why Karl Rove? Well, Karl Rove, I guess, was early on because Karl Rove, you know, is kind of, they call Bush's brain, although I don't think that's fair. I think Bush is bright. He's just, uh, was a, more malleable than his father because he hadn't studied up on foreign policy as much as his dad. Um, Karl Rove, I think, you know, he, um, he was the one, they found his computer disk or whatever and found out that he intended to, he thought, you know, he could win majorities in Congress by pushing the war. And so, uh, in the beginning of the book, Karl Rove uh, is featured as someone who wants to use war for political purposes. But then Cheney sort of becomes the Iago later. Poppy. That is Bush one. You like to use that poppy word. That's what his nickname in the family. I didn't make that up. That's what they call him. And they, they have all kinds of ways to differentiate him from his son. Sometimes he calls himself HW, you know, his middle initials. And um, then I was there the night Baker, uh, in the inaugural speech for Bush two, Baker said, we're going to have to start calling them 41 and 43. And I reported that quote. And then they all began calling themselves that. So it's ways they differentiate themselves. What do you suspect would happen if you were to sit down with George W. Bush, President Bush, 43, and talk Shakespeare? Well, I did do a cultural interview with him, and 
you know, and with his dad, and with Carrie, and with Gore. And, the, and, and when I do the cultural interviews, it's interesting because people don't have to know a lot about culture to come across well in them. And I think Bush and his father both came across well because they didn't try and pretend they knew more than they did. Bush, this Bush said that uh, he considered baseball, you know, a primary cultural experience, and he loved cats, and he loved Jack the, the Nicholson. Musical cats. Mm -hmm. And I think those interviews are just a way to get people's uh, off of their speech chunks and get them on a different turf so that you can see what they're like. And if they don't try to be something they're not, I think they come across very engagingly. Um, and that was contrasted with John Kerry, who's sort of a Renaissance man and knows a lot. But, uh, you know, the first question was about movies, and he reeled off about 41 movies because he was looking for the answer that would please me. You know, he just wanted to get the right answer. And there is no right answer, you know, so you can, it's very revealing about people. Do you have any suspicion right now uh, who will end up being president? I don't. I think it's too volatile. I don't think any of our political reporters would even venture a guess because it, there are too many things that are outside their control in terms of the terror threats and, um, and the electorate. You could see Kerry didn't get a bounce, and that's because the electorate is so locked in. You know, I'm just, I'm just hoping we don't have another deadlock. <laughs> but, uh, but as a, a columnist, so you're looking ahead. If John Kerry were to win, what do you, you think you'd end up with? I mean, it sounds like you didn't think you'd have much when you went into the Bush administration. Yeah, I don't. You never know the effect that pow power will have on ego. You know, and I've given up. You know, in life and in in politics, I've given up trying to figure out. You know, what sort of leaders people will be. It's like. Uh, you know, anything else in life, you can't really tell how people will change when they get a lot of power. That's why that's a cliche now, absolute power corrupts absolutely, because it is just a very heady tonic. You know, James Carville has that line, you know, heaven forfend any politician get a 90% approval rating, because it just goes straight to their bloodstream. So in effect, what you're saying is that no matter how many speeches John Kerry gives between now and November the 3rd or whatever happens uh, in these debates, it really doesn't matter. We don't know what they're going to be like as leaders. Um, no, you can, no, you can gauge to a certain extent, but I do think the White House, in my experience, the White House is like a soundproof booth. People get in there and they can't seem to hear anything that's going on right outside the White House grounds. It's a very odd effect. And they do, you know, for instance, the first President Bush, the one thing he, he really seemed to um, not want to have Richard Darman in his inner circle. But for some reason, Richard Darman ended up in his inner circle. And then he began following Darman's advice to his detriment. You know, so they'll say things they're definitely not going to do before they get in. And then for some reason, it all changes. I mean, it's a very strange, you know, weather in the White House. It just changes everyone. Let me go back to the question I asked you about Shakespeare. If you sat down and had a conversation with George W. Bush about Shakespeare, mm -hmm. would he know? what you know about Shakespeare and does it matter? I don't, I don't think um, uh, that was one of his areas of interest, Shakespeare. And it doesn't, it doesn't matter. But how important is it to you? And how important is the study of Shakespeare to what you are as a writer? Um, well, I try, what I try to do with humor and with serious columns is to let the reader see politics almost like a Shakespearean drama in the sense that you have running characters and, and you try and let them get to know the characters and the traits they have so that they can see it as one piece. And obviously, you know, <laughs> I can only idolize Shakespeare. I can't really compare to him in any way. So, but that is what I aim to do. Complete switch. Why did you go to Saudi Arabia? What year did you go there? And what did you see? I went um, last year, and um, they, after 9-11, um, they, uh, the Saudi Arabian foreign minister came to the Times up at board for lunch and said, and they were on a charm offensive, and they said, if you would just come to our country, you would know that we are not, that we didn't send these hijackers, that we didn't, um, you know, finance them, and you should just come. And so Phil Tobin and I, you know, stood by the door as he left, and we said, we'd really like to come. <laughs> and so well, at that... With the times. Yeah, and at that point, he sort of had to arrange it, and we went, and it was uh, fascinating and amazing. Who'd you go with? 
I went with Phil Tubman. But who from the Saudis took care of you? Oh, um, uh, there were several people. Uh, you know, they gave us a minder from the Ministry of Information, and um, you know, the the Saudis can be very charming. You know? But the fellow, there was a fellow there from went to Georgetown, graduated. Adel, yeah, he wasn't. I didn't see much of him. He happened to be with me the night I was arrested. Thank goodness. But I didn't see much of him on the trip at all. And when you went, did you have to dress a certain way? Well, I asked um, reporters who had covered the Middle East how to dress, and I asked the uh, embassy here, and they said if you wore uh, skirts uh, below the knee, sort of toward the ankle, and loose clothes, and long sleeves, and a scarf on your head, that that was fine. But that was what I was wearing when I was arrested, or detained, or whatever. So that was not enough. And I think... You know, the arrest was um, emblematic of the fact of the tension in Saudi Arabia where they're trying to be more open and Western, but then they've traded off to the Wahhabi clerics and the Ministry of Vice and Virtue so that even as they are saying, yes, we're more open, come here, you know, they've traded things off and these guys are going around arresting women. And this was in the main mall next to the main Western hotel connected. So, you know, they have a dicey juxtaposition there. Why were you arrested? Well, I went, um, you know, Saudi Arabia is so strange because they have, um, uh, you know, the whole place is filled with lingerie shops. So on the one hand, you're not, women are not, you know, they think that civilization will crumble if you see a woman's knee or neck. But on the other hand, there are lingerie shops everywhere. So, um, uh, I went to make some notes on the fact there was a Harvey Nichols and they had all this lingerie and I thought it would make a funny story at some point. And I was just walking over while I was killing time for our plane to take off one night. And Adel had happened to have dinner with us. And Who is Adel? Adel is the Saudi spokesman. And, Based um, here? Yes, sometimes, yeah, most of the time. And he he um, is also a you know top aide to the Crown Prince. and. Uh, so we were walking, I just took some notes on all the different lingerie at Harvey Nichols and how hilarious it is that all the women are always completely covered, yet there's more lingerie shops than you would see in Vegas. And we were on our way back and, uh, and these three guys raced up and began, you know, talking in Arabic and, and Otto said, uh, talked to them for about 15 minutes and the scary part was, it seemed to me he should have just been able to say, I am the top aide to the crown prince, and they should have left, and they didn't. I mean, they were arguing with him, and it took a really long time, and then he had to get on their cell phone and call someone else. So that showed me that, you know, there are certain members of the royal family who are not on board with any kind of modernization program. And it took him about 15 or 20 minutes, and Phil thought I was going to miss the plane. It took him 15 or 20 minutes to talk them out of it. And even then, they wanted me to go in one of these shops and buy an abaya and put it on just to walk 10 steps back into my hotel. Um, so. Did you write anything while you were there? You know, I did have to write something while I was there. And the Saudis are all hooked up on internet, so the ones I was meeting would read it and then comment on it. Um, yeah, but I, I had to. I couldn't really wait. I didn't have anything in the bank, as they say. November 27th, 2002, a golden couple chasing away a black cloud. Prince Bandar is known as the Arab Gatsby. Mm. Rising from a murky past in a racist society, born in a Bedouin tent as the son of an African palace servant, impregnated by a Saudi prince to a glamorous present as a dean, to, the, to a glamorous present as a dean of the Washington Diplomatic Corps. How does he fit in all this, and why did you write about him? Well, Bandar is also a fantastic, colorful character. He is a, a jet pilot who can fly a plane upside down, you know. Uh, close to the ground and he he was so close to the first President Bush he was called Bandar Bush and very you know he has like mansions everywhere um, in Spain and, and England and hunting mansions and he takes um, the first Bush uh, pheasant hunting and um, you know he smokes cigars he's a very glamorous figure close to all presidents 
So he is the guy who was on the hot spot after 9-11 because he went from being dean of the diplomatic corps and this very close friend. He's, he's a very popular guy. He, he was close to Tennant. He's, you know, sort of friend, very close to Cheney, friendly with Bob Woodward. You know, he's just a real charmer. And suddenly he was the guy who, who was the diplomat from the country that where, you know, all the most of the hijackers were from. You're right. Prince Bandar, the representative of an oil kingdom, is so close to the Bushes and oil dynasty that they nicknamed him Bandar Bush. He contributed over a million dollars to the Bush presidential library. Mm. Is that a problem? Well, you know, I guess in uh, House of Bush, House of Saud, Craig Unger and then Michael Morris picked up a lot of that, that, you know, the Saudis do tend to um, spread around a lot of money and gifts to get favor with people. Um, I was going to say also, you know, Bandar is the one who, who, who got the plane full of bin Ladens out of the country because he is so influential. I mean, that's the kind of thing a Bandar could do. they didn't leave to the 13th. No, I'm just saying that he arranged for arranged them. Arranged all that. Yeah. Um, I, I'll tell you a story. For instance, uh, uh, one Saudi I met over there who was back in D.C. after, you know, while I was, um, after we got back, at one point we were having dinner and he, um, he brought a box out and passed it across the table and I said, what's this? And he goes, open it. And I opened it and it was, um, I forget, a necklace or a bracelet. And I just started laughing. I said, I can't take this. And he went, oh. And he took it back and he handed it to me under the table. <laughs> and that was such a great metaphor for this, not more than a metaphor, but an illustration of, of the Saudi technique. And I said, no, no, I can't <laughs> take it under the table either. So. Did you have conclusions about the whole society after being there for what, four days, you say? Well, it's a fascinating, you know, it's all the men are in white robes, all the women are in black robes. When on, on their Friday, which is their, their day of worship, you know, you never see a woman on the street. It's just men and their sons going to <sighs> worship. And I, you know, at one point, as I say, I was wearing what I thought I should be wearing. But when I went out, even all covered up by my standards, you know, the guys would lean out of cars and scream at me you know, cover up and get your abaya on. I mean, it's, it's an amazing country. I mean, it, the, the Saudis were very focused on, um, you know, why we hadn't worked more on the Palestinian situation instead of going into Iraq. I mean, that was their obsession over there. And as one of them said to me, you know, they, uh, they, lo they love America. A lot of them had been to school here or sent their kids to school here. One of them loved Hoosiers basketball. And yet, they also were drawn to what Osama did. And as one of them said, you know, it wasn't that bad to see the bully punched in the face. And they meant us, like 9-11 they were talking about. And they had one building that uh, ha was very modern architecture and had sort of a hole in the top. And, and an architect there joked, oh, that's the building we used to train terrorists. You know, so very, very complicated uh, people. You, from time to time, refer to the fact that you're an Irish Catholic. Mm. Practicing? Yes. Uh, you have a chapter here called Playing the Jesus Card. Mm. And you quote George Bush as saying in a speech, um, when you turn your heart and your life over to Christ, when you accept Christ as the Savior, it changes your heart, it changes your life, and that's what happened to me, George Bush. And then you say, translation, you either in, uh, you're, you're either in the Christ Club or out of it, on the JC team or off. This is the same exclusionary attitude so offensive to those with different beliefs that he showed in 1993 when he said that you must believe in Jesus Christ to enter heaven. Mr. Bush has since conceded that only, quote, God decides who goes to heaven, not George W. Bush. As a practicing Catholic, and you hear all this talk in politics about God, what do you think? And you obviously commented there you didn't think. Well, my that. dad, you know, my dad had two precious possessions. One was his scrapbook of Al Smith running for president, the first Catholic to run for president in 28. And one was his big picture of JFK. He loved JFK. And I think, you know, I grew up with the perspective of JFK. Our hearts would stop, you know, when, uh, 
the subject of religion came up because we wanted so much when I was little for him to be president and be the first Catholic president. And in order to do that, he had to keep religion completely out of the race. You know, he had to prove that the Pope wasn't going to uh, have a tunnel going straight to the West Wing. And he had to, you know, try hard to make it clear that religion and church and state were going to be separated. And then, you know, now it's the opposite. I mean, you see politicians and this president president bringing their religion in as a way to, you know, um, kind of sell themselves. So it may be just my background, but I just, I don't like it. What if they really believe it? Well, I'm, no, I'm not questioning his belief, of course. Well, I, I mean, respect, you know, they... no, I respect his belief. I just don't think they should bring it so much into the political arena. Um, but why not? Because I, I, for instance, you know, this amazing thing that Bush told Bob Woodward, where Bob Woodward said, was pressing him, saying, but why didn't you talk to your father? He was the only other president who had ever gone to war with Saddam. Shouldn't you have, you know, just asked his advice, gotten his counsel before you went to war with the same dictator, you know? And uh, Bush said, I consulted a higher father. You know, and I just think... You know, again, it's kind of, it, it, it's giving the sense that God is, you know, that he's on a mission, that the war is a mission from God. And I think you have to stay away from this language that implies to Muslims that it's a holy war. I mean, of course, Abraham Lincoln brings in, you know, brought in God in a very beautiful way in his speeches. And of course, you can bring it in. But uh, I think not to the point where it's a political card. The last two sentences in your book, in the column that you run, and it's from June 10th. It's the last you wrote that got into the book, 2004. Whether he was right or wrong, Ronald Reagan was exhilarating. Whether he is right or wrong, George W. Bush is a bummer. Mm. Well, it's funny because he comes across, he presents himself as this world-class optimist. But at the same time, he's sort of insulted and blown off a lot of the world. And then... You know, it's it's an interesting contrast with Kerry because Kerry comes across just you know his way, his look is a lugubrious loner, and yet he's he's campaigning on the idea that we need more friends and allies in the world, and we have to go back to our traditional structures of allies. So that it's an interesting dynamic there. How many columns in your book do you own? Do you count? No. Mm -mm. Mm. We're out of time. Okay. Thank you. This is the cover of the book. Maureen Dowd, our guest columnist for the New York Times, called Bush World, Enter at Your Own Risk. For a DVD or videotape, call 1-877-ON-C-SPAN. For a free transcript or to learn more about Book Notes, visit us at booknotes.org. Next week on Book Notes, our guest is Speaker of the House Denny Hastert, author of Speaker, Lessons from 40 Years of Coaching and Politics. Book Notes can be seen every Sunday on C-SPAN at 8 p.m. Eastern and Pacific.